Um, I will, I will uh, I'll get started now. Um, welcome and thank you for showing up. Um, I will be talking about Quick. Um, and if you were at last year's NetDev, there's going to be some of that material that's rehashed here, uh, but hopefully not too much. But I will start off with a uh, general sort of an introduction to Quick. So the plan here is to have a, a general introduction to Quick, an overview and sort of what Quick is in this part, pre-lunch. And post-lunch, I'll dive into uh, the details of the protocol. Some of the details of the protocol, I'll dive into uh, an open source implementation, and I'll talk about um, uh, how how you might write an example, ap a sample application. I might, I, if I have enough time, I'll do a code read through of a sample application, and I'll show you um, uh, uh, how I, I would basically run it and show you some tr packet traces from that uh, run. So that's the that's the goal. So this first part is just basically me talking through things, and then maybe um, the second part will be more uh, hands-on if you're interested. But uh, yeah, that's the goal. Um, this tutorial is supposed to be uh, me along with Ian Sweat from Google, but he's decided that uh, uh, he's, he's going to pass on this to hold on to his family. So he's going to be here for next week, also for the IETF. I'm kidding about that. But he's, it's, it's, he's uh, unfortunately, you're stuck listening to my voice for an hour and a half. Hopefully it's not too boring, and I'll try to keep it uh, uh, quick and going forward fast. So I'm, I work at Fastly. Um, and uh, uh, my colleague uh, Kazuo Oku, who also works at Fastly, helped me with some of the uh, uh, with a bunch of material here. So much thanks to him. Um, how many of you are familiar with Quick? How many of you have never heard about Quick? Yeah, right. All right. Well, good enough. Um, if you haven't, you should be ashamed. You are right to not raise your hand. Google it. Look it up. I'll start with a very quick history of what, what Quick is. Um, it was basically a protocol for HTTPS transport, and uh, it was deployed at Google starting in 2014. So full disclosure, I used to work at Google, um, and, I, and I moved to Fastly about a year ago. Um, uh, and uh, this, some of this stuff is data that uh, was generated while I was at Google. Um, so the... Uh, protocol was deployed between Google services and uh, uh, Chrome and mobile apps. So we basically had control, Google had control over uh, the, all the servers and also over Chrome and over first party mobile apps like YouTube application, Google search app on Android and so on. And Quick was deployed as an application level transport sitting on top of uh, uh, UDP on both sides. And the performance benefit that we started to see was, was good and it was so good um, that we basically turned on, uh, 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 turned it on uh, to, to uh, basically 100% of what we could, which meant that it became about 35, more than 35% of Google's egress traffic in bytes was was quick. And this is from two years. These numbers are from two years ago. Um, but yes, uh, it improved application performance, specifically YouTube video rebuffers and uh, Google search latency uh, uh, by quite a bit, as you can see. And these numbers are actually uh, substantial, partly because they're not micro benchmarks, they're end-to-end -end measures. So changing a transfer protocol changed the end-to-end -end application level quality of experience metrics significantly. And again, Google search latency, it's, not, it's, no, it's no small task to change one of the most optimized applications on the planet, and being able to move it by that, that amount was quite significant. Um, and since then, we formed an IETF working group to modularize and to standardize uh, much of Quick. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, that's, that, that became the goal of it. So what are we talking about? Just let's go back to basics for a moment. That's our uh, traditional, well-known, well-understood uh, HTTPS tag that you know half of this room tries to optimize TCP for because, let's face it, what's TCP being used for if not HTTPS? Practically nothing else. But uh, uh, that's the stack that we have and love and use the most. And what Quick does is effectively replaces um, uh, a big chunk of that stack. So it replaces TCP entirely. Uh, it replaces. It doesn't replace TLS, but it sort of encapsulates it in an interesting way, 
and it, it replaces a whole bunch of what HTTP2 provided um, uh, for HTTP. So it subsumes a lot of that functionality, and running HTTP on top of Quick is now HTTP3. So the version of HTTP that runs on top of Quick is a, uh, it's a slightly, it's, it's different, uh, it's quite different than HTTP2 because as I said, much of that functionality has been subsumed in Quick. Um, so the mapping of HTTP on top of Quick is HTTP3. And TLS 1.3 is basically, uh, a, a, as you can see here, it's embedded effectively in Quick. Um, and it, it, the, I can talk more about this mapping, but I'll move on. And if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I have a mic here that uh, uh, feels very lonely. All right. So these are the IETF uh, internet drafts. Uh, you're welcome to go read them if you feel like you're unable to fall asleep um, or if you enjoy hurting yourself badly. Um, but I want to very briefly start with basically what I call the HTTP story. So if, if just, just looking back a bit, to place all of this in context, right? What is Quick coming from? Where is this coming from? And why are we working on this? Um, HTTP, uh, it's, it goes back further beyond that, of course, but HTTP 1.0, 1.1 happened in the late 90s, uh, and there was an HTTP NG uh, effort. Uh, there was a working group and a, and a big effort in the late 90s and early 2000s. Anybody remember the HTTP NG effort? Anybody here a part of this effort at all? No? There was, a, there, was a, there was a pretty big push at the time to try and figure out how to solve the problems that, that were seen in HTTP. And I won't list them all here, but uh, eventually, much, much later, HTTP2 showed up a few years ago as a standard, and HTTP2 introduced notions uh, such as streams and multiplexing of objects. Now, all of you are familiar with the TCP problem of head of line blocking, yeah? TCP serializes everything that's sent down that connection and the receiver, if there's, a, if there's a loss, the receiver holds on to packets that are received later, cannot deliver them up to the application until the loss is repaired. And in HTTP, you typically send a whole bunch of different objects into the same connection. And the receiver, even if that lost packet does not belong to the same object as subsequent packets, sub subsequent packets are still held in the TCP buffers. So this is head of line blocking that TCP introduces. And uh, HTTP2, uh, uh, sorry, HTTP NG was trying to solve these problems. Some of these problems got solved with HTTP2 a few years ago. Um, um, but that was basically, you know, uh, like I said, streams and multiplexing that allows uh, 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 multiple objects to be sent on the same connection but interleaved. Um, and then introduces uh, flow control per stream effectively and priorities across multiple objects. So the idea in HTTP2 was to use one connection more efficiently for multiple objects. With HTTP 1.1, objects are sent back to back. A whole object is sent and the, subs and the next object is requested and then sent uh, behind that. HTTP 2 interleaves multiple objects. So you can receive multiple requests at the same time, serve multiple objects at the same time. And by the, at the same time, I mean multiplexed on the same connection. Um, but there's a big gap right there, right? From the 90s to a few years ago, massive gap. I don't know who, uh, not a lot really happened in the HTTP community on the time. Now you folks might be more familiar with this uh, 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 schedule. Anybody remember TTCP here? Oh, come on. I'm seeing some nods, that's good enough for me. So what happened in the transport world? Around, so we were also trying to solve problems, similar problems. We were trying, some of the problems were shared and similar. We tried to solve similar problems. TTCP was one of the things that was proposed, it was proposed in 94. Anybody can, can anybody tell me what TTCP solved? What's the problem that it solves? Yep, sure. Yep. So TTCP basically eliminates the handshake latency. So it was going after a particular type of uh, uh, traffic, which is small objects, right? Because that's where the handshake latency plays in the most. 
And guess what the web is made of? A lot of small objects. So that handshake latency really hurts uh, uh, when you're talking about web traffic. And HTTP2 was trying to solve, go after that problem in a different way by trying to say, let's put more objects on the same connection. Same thing HTTP1.1 did. How, uh, anyways, TTCP was trying to solve a similar problem, was basically trying to eliminate handshake latency. And it effectively, later on, it sort of jumped and showed up again in 2009 as TCP fast open. And you may be familiar with that. Uh, and that's basically doing the same thing. Uh, and it's just become more important to us now. Um, but then we had other things as well, which were trying to make TCP better for web traffic. And not, they weren't focused just on web traffic, but they were effectively, all the efforts were, what they were trying to do would make web traffic work much better with TCP. And there's a big gap again. And then there are some proposals. And then TCP fast open happens in, TCP fast open happens in 2009. Uh, and uh, uh, can anybody tell me how widely TCP fast open is deployed? Anybody here, by the way, how many people here know TCP fast open? I should ask that question first. Okay, good. How widely is this deployed? I know Praveen can answer this question. How widely is this deployed? Not very widely, Not very widely you say. Not very widely. Praveen, what do you say? He agrees. Praveen agrees. It's not very widely deployed. 2009 and it's 2019. Ten years later, not very widely deployed. What happened here? And what happened in that gap here? We had SCTP just before that gap. Anybody here familiar with SCTP? Little bit? Enough. How much SCTP do we have today? Actually, a lot if you count all the bits. Because if you're making a phone call right now, you're using SCTP. And that phone, if you're using, you know, the telephony signaling switches, you're using SCTP. But if you're using the internet, you're not using SCTP. What happened in all of these spaces? What happened to keep TCP fast open from getting deployed since then? What happened? Anybody? One word. Middle boxes, Middle boxes says somebody. And yes, <laughs> you get lunch. Um, <laughs> everybody else here has to stay, and 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 I'll walk you through what happened. Um, Middle boxes happened. Well, they didn't quite happen during that time. They've always been around. It's just that they became a real problem during that time. So what, what are these things? Are basically intermediate devices that look past the IP header. That's effectively what they are, at a, at a very, very basic definition level, right? And uh, they are pervasive. They're everywhere. You're using one right now, and you don't even know it, right? I mean, that's basically how pervasive it is. Home routers, firewalls, Everything, everything that your, your every every packet that goes on the internet today touches at least one middle box, right? Uh, most likely. So these things basically destroyed, in some ways, our ability to be able to deploy new transports, and 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 uh, deploy new changes. And we didn't quite have a good way of handling this problem. And we tried to deploy changes, and we still try to. You know, TCP fast open is a great example of this, right? We want to. We want to deploy these changes, but it's hard. It's really hard to deploy new changes on an internet that is fundamentally ossified by middle boxes. Middle boxes expect a certain type of behavior from various protocols, and if those protocols change, they break in unknown ways. And that's a huge problem. So. With that, I'll switch to basically what we started off wanting to build Quick to do. We wanted Quick to be deployable today. We didn't want to wait for NATS to come on board. We didn't want to wait for middle boxes to come on board. We wanted to deploy it today. And we wanted it to be evolvable as well. So we put it in user space on top of UDP so we could deploy it right away. If it is a new transport like SCTP, we could wait for another 20 years and then say it's still not deployed. Or we could deploy on top of UDP and basically give up the battle uh, to try and deploy new things on top of IP and say, well, maybe we'll actually have something. So we tried, and we did, and we got something. So we deployed it on top of UDP, and that was a very deliberate design choice. And it's in user space, and that allowed us to iterate much more rapidly at the endpoints. Uh, and that was also a very deliberate design choice. And we wanted it to be available as well. Um, and we encrypt encrypted and authenticated the headers. So why does evolvable and encryption and authentication of headers, why are they in the same bullet point here? Why are they in the same conversation? You don't get very many points for this, but you'll get some points if you answer this. Because, 
because metal boxes can't treat them. You get another lunch. <laughs> and you're running out of your quota, by the way. Others have to answer, too. Um, but yes, exactly. This is, this is uh, 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 if, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain this with the story, right? So a little while ago, um, what we now call GQuick is basically Google's Quick. So I haven't really like, worked through this, but Google's original version of Quick is now called GQuick because the IDF is standardizing Quick, and that is actually quite different than the original version of Quick, which is now called GQuick because we didn't want to call this iQuick because that would be quick and this would be iQuick, and this is the thing we wanted to stay forever, so we call this quick and that gQuick. If I haven't confused you enough, just, it's all right. Um, so the first byte of gQuick was basically, uh, uh, every packet was, was a byte was called flags. Now you know what flags are used for, right? They're basically Booleans, right? The, 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 you ought to be able to flip them back and forth, and that's sort of the goal with them. So. That's what we, we, we it, was un, it was unencrypted because it was required for the, re, the receiver had to be able to see it to figure out how to parse the rest of the packet. And so this was unencrypted and had been seven for a little while because we hadn't flipped any bits. And by a little while, I mean about nine months to a year, it had not changed very much. So we did what you do with flags, right? We flipped a bit. And then everything went to hell. We get this, you know, P0 call saying uh, uh, the new Chrome version that was launched, uh, uh, users can't reach the internet over 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 Chrome. They can't use reach any Google property over Chrome. And uh, it was we were able to quickly, you know, bisect it down and figure out that this was because of Quick. And by the way, the users are saying, oh, by the way, we can't reach Google over Chrome, but we can reach it just fine using Firefox, right? So that's when it really hurts because you go, this is because Firefox wasn't doing quick and we were doing quick. And so we figured out it was quick and, and, and uh, uh, long story short, it took us a while, but um, um, basically we, we, we narrowed it down and we, and we, with the help of a bunch of really helpful uh, users, we were able to figure out that the, the common thing that caused this to break down in various places was the presence of a particular vendor's firewall, right? So what was this firewall doing? After but much digging, what we found out that it was allowing the first packet of an unknown protocol to go through in both directions, and then it would decide, this is not something I want to allow, so it black all subsequent packets. Now this is particularly problematic for Quick because the way uh, Chrome detects whether Quick works or not. Chrome basically does a, 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 it tries Quick, and if Quick doesn't work, it'll fall back to TCP. The way it does that is it'll try to do a quick handshake, and if the quick handshake succeeds, it'll say, okay, I'm going to go through with Quick. If the quick handshake fails, it'll fall back to TCP. Now, of course, this firewall allowed the quick handshake to go through, right? And then Chrome said, Quick works, and then the firewall black holed everything. Right, so this was basically the worst of all worlds for us, and this was a big problem. Uh, why did the firewall decide to do this? Because they basically uh, uh, found that the protocol that they were seeing this packet come from was not quick. They saw that this packet that was coming through was not quick, so they allowed it and then they black holed it because it did not fall into their category of what was quick. So how did they detect quick? What they did was they opened up Wireshark. Now our docs are already public at this time. They simply looked at the trace for a little while and they said, guess what? It looks like the first byte is always the same. Guess what the classifier looks like then? And this was verified more or less, yeah? Now, this is basically what we had to deal with, right? So this was one byte that was open, not encrypted and we had this massive issue that we, and this was not a public protocol, this was entirely proprietary, it was not, you know, it was deployed only within Google and it was not very widespread traffic at the time. We hadn't ramped up the traffic to the extent that we did afterwards. But that's what we dealt with. And that's one of the times when we, when we realized that we had made the right decision and the fact that the only way 
the only way you protect a protocol and you protect evolvability of any protocol and of the internet is by using encryption. This is not to say that middle boxes aren't doing useful things, which if you catch me off in the corridors, I will tell you why they are not doing useful things. But for the purposes of this conversation, um, it's that they un there, there are unintended consequences to what they do, and they don't necessarily take those into account. Ossification is one of those unintended, unintended consequences. They've stepped on things to the extent that it does not allow us to evolve protocols in ways that we want. So, um, that is why that figured as the top item in our design uh, uh, maxims, so to speak. Um, we wanted to then, of course, performance is important. Somebody's got to pay for you to build the stuff and uh, uh, reducing latency, as it turns out, pays for building this stuff. So we wanted mostly zero RTT and sometimes one RTT uh, connection establishment. This is, you know, if you understand TCP fast open and TLS 1.3, this is roughly the same as that. Now, of course, as I said, TLS 1.3 has deployment issues and TCP, fa uh, and sorry, TCP fast open has deployment issues. TLS 1.3 came afterwards um, and, and that's something that we've been now incorporating in the IETF work into Quick. So this was an important characteristic. And uh, as I noted earlier, some of the features of HTTP2, which were necessary and very useful for, for web traffic, streams and multiplexing, that, was, that became part of Quick. Uh, this was also very important and useful. Um, further on, we also wanted to do better with loss recovery and congestion control, or at least we didn't think that we necessarily could do substantially better on congestion control, but we could make it possible and easier for people to play with congestion controllers. And that's, we went about building uh, the stack in such a way. So um, um, you'll actually see a little bit more of this later, but uh, 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 a quick packet design is such that it allows for us to do much more efficient loss recovery and, uh, um, and, and gives a lot more information to the congestion controller as well about how it can detect uh, uh, network um, uh, usage. Um, and additionally, because, again, NATs, because things don't like UDP so much in the network and uh, so on, we have a connection ID that's in the part of the transport header, part of the, uh, by the way, point of clarification here, how many people here think UDP is a transport? Tom, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you can raise your hand, it's okay. I might say yes. <laughs> it's not, sorry, I fooled you there. No, it's not, it's not, it's not. It's, 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 it's a way to build, a, I, I keep saying UDP is not a transport, it's a way to build one. And Tom is there shaking his head going no. Yeah, I know, I've, RFC 1122 says Tom, and it's four pages, say, says me. That's not a full transport. But anyways, we can have this debate later. Yeah, we can have this debate later. The point here is that UDP is a simply uh, 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 a way to build something that's, that I would call a full-fledged transport on top. But UDP has port numbers, and, and NATs don't, uh, uh, there, are, there are issues with, with uh, NATs and rebinding. And so anyways, uh, we have a, a, a connection ID in the Quick protocol itself that allows us to, to, to not care as much about the fortuple and have a connection ID that identifies the connection instead. And this connection ID is part of the, the packet header and is authenticated so nobody can mess around with it as well. Um, it's it's uh, useful. It was primarily meant for NAT rebinding because NATs understand TCP. They hold on, for the, hold on to TCP state for a TCP connection, uh, but they don't understand quick or UDP. There are, there's no notion of UDP connections, so they'll drop state whenever they decide to, and so we have to be willing to deal with NAT rebindings, and so uh, that also gives us mobility, basically, right? The holy grail of things that we've been trying to do for a long time, MPTCP, for example. But yeah, it gives us mobility also for free. Uh, with not quite for free, but, it, but we get that with connection ID. 
So um, I'm basically going to uh, uh, not talk more about the details of, of Quick here. I'll talk a little bit more about the packetization details and so on after the, after the break. Um, but I want to, to uh, show you roughly why we care about this. We've talked about head of line blocking and those latencies might seem small and it seems like, you know, who are we really solving these problems for? And, and, and this, this should be instructive a little bit. A, this is basically showing quick performance improvement by, by geo, by country. And this is for YouTube uh, video. And uh, this was rebuffer rates, uh, uh, reduction in, 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 in rebuffer rate for YouTube. Um, for South Korea, which has a min RTD of about 38 milliseconds and a TCP retransmit rate of about 1%, um, the reduction in rebuffer rate is modest. It's modest on, on mobile, actually, um, but it's basically not existent on desktop. And if you've seen bandwidths in Korea in general, you'll understand why. It's hard to do anything anywhere else to improve that performance because it's super, super good anyways. If you get to a place like the US, which is, you know, a little crappier than, than, uh, than South Korea, you start to see more improvements. It's when you get to a place like India, which has really sucky connectivity, that quick shines. So the value of Quick is in being able to make connectivity much better where it really, really sucks. Um, so how have we been working on this over the past couple of years? We've been uh, um, uh, working on this at the IETF. We've been working with some very, uh, uh, with, a, with a large number of uh, uh, folks across the board. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's coming to a stable point, I'll say, unofficially, informally, on tape. Um, but it's, 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 it's come along quite a bit since uh, when we started. The focus on security and privacy has gotten even stronger um, over the past couple of years. Um, and that's rubbed a lot of network operators the wrong way. And not, I shouldn't say it's rubbed them the wrong way. It's basically we've, we've, we've had a lot of uh, um, contention within the working group on how to, because network operators are used to seeing a certain amount of transport information and quick basically hides everything. So there's been some contention, discussion, debate, and uh, we've had that, but that's all been, I'd say, healthy. And there's been a very strong focus on avoiding ossification through encryption and, and greasing, which is a mechanism. I won't get into the details here. Um, what's the world uh, like right now in terms of implementations? We have a large number of implementations right now working on building and interoperating with Quick. We're going to have a number of these at the interop this weekend uh, at, uh, at the IETF. Um, so Apple has a couple of implementations, as it turns out. One of them is for ATS, Apache Traffic, traffic Server, and the other one is a proprietary one. Fastly, has, uh, uh, our, we have our own uh, implementation. It's called Quickly because we are cute with names like that. Um, Facebook has its implementation. Uh, Firefox has an implementation, F5. Google's is Chromium, that's open source. Microsoft has theirs, uh, which is not open source. Lightspeed and QuickGo, which is in Go um, uh, for the carry web server. So there are a number of implementations out there, and a lot of them, are, they're all working on interoperating with each other, and they're all spending a lot of effort and energy building these up to speed. Um, we'll be, actually, we will be looking at uh, Quickly here. I won't be going into the details of how Quickly implements Quick, but I'll be talking about the surface of Quickly, how an application might use it. It's going to be a little tenuous, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and uh, uh, as it turns out, because this is being built in user space and as libraries, um, there's no one socket-like API. They all have their own APIs, basically. Um, and so one of the things that Jamal had asked me when, when, when arranging this talk was, hey, can you, can you actually you know, do a simple thing where people can write a Hello World program like with you know, an intro to sockets type of thing? I'm like, there is no sockets here. Like, I mean, in the sense that there is no unified API. So, but 
uh, the one I'm going to show you is quickly, it's available open source, and you can play with it afterwards if you would like. Um, so, so uh, and, and, and the number of implementations, like Chromium, for example, is building it for its own HTTP stack, so it's not separable, really, uh, from the rest of the HTTP stack. So quick as in library is not separable from its HTTP. The surface that it exposes is on top of HTTP. So you would do a get URL request on top of the, the Chrome networking stack, but you can't really pull at quick and say, I want to have an API that simply uses quick and build my own application on top of quick. That's much harder to do. So that's about it for our pre-lunch time, and I'm 15 seconds. It's 12.33. Sorry, three minutes past when I said I would end. But I'll see you back here. What time is it? One something? 1.20? Anybody? 1.20? 1.20. Okay. So 1.20. We'll pick it back up from here and we'll go into more interesting stuff. Thank you all. All right. I think we have quorum here. Shall we start? Get here. I hope you've had your coffee. Don't blame me later if you fall asleep. Okay, um, so I want to pick up where we left off. Any thoughts? Any questions about what we what we discussed so far? Please feel free to raise them. Um, and honestly, I, 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 I love it when we're just having a conversation because ultimately, to me, the value of, of being in the same room rather than watching a YouTube video is that you can actually throw peanuts at me. Um, and I have the mic, so I get to say things to you in response. Um, so please, ask questions or throw peanuts. Um, so I want to, I'm, I'm realizing that there's, there's, there's a, there's a very wide mix of people in this room. So what I'm going to do is change the plan slightly. I'm not going to do a full code read through. I'll show the code, but I'm basically just going to show it. Um, and I'm happy to discuss the details. And I'm going to go over the API, but I'm also going to go over the code, but I'm not going to go into it in substantial detail because I think there's other discussion elements as well that might show up later. I'm going to show you some tooling, and there might be other discussion later as well, and I'm happy to engage in pretty much all of that. Um, any of you have questions about the IT of process or anything like that? I want to leave enough room for Q&A later. So, um, and again, this session might go on a few minutes past the end time, because again, we are starting a little bit late. Um, but, but I should be done um, by 2.30 at the latest. Okay, so um, this is where we left off. We were talking about quick, and we were talking about the fact that there are different implementations. Um, and each one of them has its own API to how you use Quick, and some of them don't even have a well-defined API at the moment. And this is all evolving. So as these implementations mature, there's, there's been talk, and we've talked about this in the past, about actually having some sort of standardized notion of an API. I don't think it's going to be as rigid as the POSIX API, but it could certainly be something that's a broader sort of an abstract API for Quick um, that all implementations uh, implement a version of. So <clears throat> we might go there. We're not there yet, certainly. But if you would like to play with Quick, then, then you're, you can. Just expect that the road will be slightly rough. Um, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of a brief about Quickly itself. Quickly is the, uh, the Fastly implementation of Quick. And this is written for the H2O web server. Um, how many of you here are familiar with the, the H2O web server? One person. Lovely. That's more than zero. Um, it was basically, it's, 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 it's a super fast HTTP2 server uh, released in 2014, and uh, it's primarily optimized for HTTP2. Um, and uh, by that, I mean it has, uh, uh, it, it, it tunes the TCP send buffer to basically be minimal. To, to minimize latency, and it's got uh, a fine-grained HTTP2 prioritization and it implements some upcoming features in HTTP2. So it's pretty cutting edge with HTTP2, and it's really focused on HTTP2 performance.
Should I unplug this? There we go. Thank you. All right. Um, and quickly uses. So as I pointed out earlier, quick is basically encrypted by default. It's always encrypted, um, and it uses a TLS one. It, it uses a TLS library to encrypt. Um, and you'll see in a moment, not in a moment, in a little while, uh, the slides. I hope. But I'll. Uh, yeah, okay, good enough. So, it, yes. So, there, are, there isn't very much to ossify in UDP in terms of features and in terms of extensions that we want to do to UDP as the protocol, UDP the protocol itself. We want to make extensions to quick, and we are we are avoiding ossification, or we are avoiding it getting ossified by encrypting everything. So the hope is that going forward, the that quick will remain not ossified. Although I I am I, I have no doubt that middlebox vendors will find clever ways of ossifying something that is fundamentally unossifiable. It's possible. We'll have to see. So the question is, what level is encryption happening at? Encryption happens at the quick level and up. So all of the quick packet headers are encrypted. The data that's inside of quick is encrypted. The UDP header is not encrypted. But everything inside of UDP is encrypted, basically. Is, is the uh, encryption on a per packet basis, or is it on a larger granularity? So the question was, is encryption on a per packet basis? The answer is yes, it's on a per packet basis. The reason you need it on a per packet basis is because you have to be able to deal with received packets out of order. Otherwise, you reintroduce the head offline blocking problem. All right. Going along here, um, um, quickly uses uh, Pico TLS as a library for doing, um, for doing SSL, uh, for doing TLS. I'm sorry, I'm showing my age. Um, and uh, TLS 1.3, the Pico TLS supports uh, various new features in TLS, such as encrypted SNI, which is going to be, by the way, a lot of fun when it hits the wires. Um, when even SNI is encrypted, it's going to be super fun. Um, and certificate compression, and it supports quick. And it, act, it has a very interesting, it has a different API than uh, OpenSSL uh, is, if you're familiar with OpenSSL. The API is different in that it specifically it supports a codex-style API in which you you send uh, you 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 give it an, uh, a plain text and it spits back uh, encrypted uh, um, the encrypted uh, text. Um, this is different from Open OpenSSL where you simply write and OpenSSL then writes into the socket below. Um, and this is quite useful because then it's modular. And Pico TLS is modular and in Quick it's very useful because Quick will basically send it to uh, send the packet to uh, um, Pico TLS, get the encrypted text back and then dump it down into the UDP socket. So we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. So the way that uh, quickly, uh, so just very quickly, um, it's written in C and was written for issue, as I said, and I've, I've already covered these points. The API uh, for quickly itself is minimal buffering. It basically supports a codex style API. Again, quickly itself supports a codex style API. Both Pico TLS and quickly both have this codex style API. Um, and that means something very particular. Well, it's also bufferless. I'll talk about the codex style API in a moment. Um, question. Co codex style API is, is, is basically you, you, you give it uh, raw data and it gives you an, the encoded data back. So that's as against you write to it and it writes as against the layered API where you write to it and it writes the layer below. This is more of a modular API. Yes. Yes. 
Um, oh, that's, that's an interesting question. So the question is, uh, Google controlled both ends of uh, the connection, so it was able to deploy quick on both ends. Um, it's not a quickly problem as much as it is a fastly problem because Fastly owns only the servers. We are basically, we are, we are a CDN with, uh, uh, with, with, and we only own the serving side. We don't know the client side necessarily. So this is why a place like the IDF is really useful because you get clients then to implement and deploy quick as well. So we are working with clients who are deploying IDF quick and we are deploying IDF quick at the servers as well. So um, yes, we rely on clients implementing, uh, but quickly itself has in it uh, a client and a server both for testing and for various purposes. But it's fundamentally being built for uh, the server. Um, yes. Excellent question. So the question was if it's bufferless, how does it handle retransmissions? And I'll, sh I'll, I'll, I'll show that in a second. The buffer is actually held by the, the, the application effectively. <coughs> and uh, quick goes up all the way to the stack to pull data when it needs to send a retransmission. So I'll get to that in a second. Um, basically, the, the value of being bufferless is that it, it, it's much less memory footprint, especially if you're, a file, if you're a server that's serving a very common object, for example. Then instead of maintaining you know, as many connections, instead of trying to scale that memory to be the number of connections, you just have one copy of this uh, in, in there. And it also allows for uh, better HTTP header compression because if you are serializing this at the last moment, your QPAC or your dictionary state is the most updated state, and so you can get more efficient compression for this. And it also allows you to do better stream prioritization because again, you're not committing data before it's time to literally put it on the wire. So you can choose from whichever stream is the highest priority at that point in time. This is very useful for HTTP uh, priorities. So um, uh, here the key is that the application defines the send, uh, send and receive buffers. And Quick simply uses the application's buffers and, and does call, I don't want to say up calls because it's not strictly layered in that sense, but it's basically like an up call into the application to get data when it needs to send it. And this really works well because it's all in user space, so there's no real context switch here. Um, so. Briefly, this is how uh, a, a typical quickly itself would do this in HTTP, for example. So when doing an HTTP 2, this is how quickly will send data. It basically pushes data into the TCP send buffers or across the kernel uh, boundary, and then the TCP sender will you know, eventually fetch data when it has the ability to send data from the send buffer and packetizes and sends it. Um, whereas in, in, in with, with quick, it's quite different. The architecture allows the application to basically maintain state per connection, and then when it's time to send data, be it a new transmission or be it a retransmission, it simply goes back into the file server or the file system or the file cache and grabs that bunch of data and literally <coughs> packetizes it, uh, encrypts it, ships it down the wire, and it's gone. So there is no intermediate buffering from the source of data all the way down. There really isn't any place that data is, is buffered. It's, it's, it's one stream through. And um, uh, the fetch itself that, uh, that happens up into the file cache here is only happening when there's permission to send at, at the quick level, meaning that if quick has condition window to send and this is the stream that we want to send data from, then it basically goes in, grabs the data, encrypts it, packetizes it, sends it. Yes, question. Yes. So is the protection really for modularity? Yeah, that can be solved with a different solution, right? I mean, so what, what is the motivation there? Because if I look at the switch, this could easily be done with a layer mm -hmm. of implementation of Quick, right? I mean, as what Quick could do. Yes. Solution. I mean, the codex style, I don't think the codex style is necessarily, I, so I can't speak to ah, the, the design okay. choice. Um, I wouldn't say the codex style is fundamental to this. You're right. You're absolutely right about that. All right. 
um, yeah, the, 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 so the, the, oh, thank you for that. I should have given you the mic earlier. Um, so the, the, the other piece that the API uh, that quickly doesn't do is it doesn't actually send packets on, uh, on the UDP socket. So the application has to do it. So this is again part of the same codex style API, which is that the application owns the buffers, the application owns the sockets, and it basically grabs data, ships it to Quick, quickly, quickly will send back packets effectively, and then quickly, and, and then the application has to take that and dump it into the, into the socket. And it quickly provides some helper functions to, to accomplish these ends. So uh, uh, this is basically how it looks. So this is roughly how the HTTP H2O itself looks. There's uh, H2O in the middle there, which which talks to uh, on the one side is on the on the left side of that picture is basically the conversation the the, the parts that are useful for HTTP one and HTTP two serving, um, and the right side is for using HTTP three and quick. So as you can see here, H2O is the, the application, owns the sockets, and it basically talks to Pico TLS on the sides and then dumps things down into the socket. And it similarly does uh, 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 so for, uh, for Quick and for HTTP3. do the same uh, architecture. So the question is, is this model unique to Quickly or are there other uh, implementations that are doing Quick using the same architecture? Um, I, I don't think it's unique, but at the same time, I don't think it's super common. Uh, in, in, uh, partly because, so the, the, the API actually comes from, from using TLS and trying to minimize latency for HTTPS using uh, TLS. And Quick just fits into that same thing. So the codex style API that I was talking to you about, where the web server owns the socket underneath. If you can see on the left side of that picture, is true for HTTP2, HTTP1 as well. So that's H2O's architecture. And H2O's architecture is so to try and minimize latency in the stack below. If you look at OpenSSL, then you basically have the application doesn't have as much control. OpenSSL is the thing that has control over record boundaries and how many things, how, how long to wait before dumping a packet down into the socket. Of course, those are all tweakable. So as uh, uh, Srijit was pointing out earlier, it's not fundamentally architecturally unique. You, can't, you can get those latency benefits from other architectures too. It's just not the case right now in things like Open, uh, OpenSSL. So um, H2O was, uh, has been trying to optimize for latency. And so this architecture allows for that. Um, it's, it's not clear exactly how it is. Others are implementing differently, I'd say. So um, with that, I'm basically just going to talk to you very briefly about what typically what you expect to see in, 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 in the Quickly API. And you'll see more calls than, than functions. But um, um, at both the client and the server, you want to be able to accept a, a uh, um, so at the client, you want to be able to connect to the server. At the server, you want to be able to accept an incoming connection from the client. And at both ends, you want to be able to create streams. Now, to be clear, uh, for those of you who may not have gathered this yet, streams are abstractions. And, and the way to think about them is from a program, from an API point of view, I create a, uh, two endpoints that uh, an endpoint creates a connection with another endpoint. And then within that connection, the endpoint creates streams. So I can open a stream to the, uh, the peer within the connection, okay? And streams are basically ephemeral uh, things and, and you use a stream to write. You can't write without opening a stream first. Anything, any data that an application writes has to be written in a stream. Is that clear? Yeah, question. So the question is, are streams unidirectional or bidirectional? Quick has both kinds. Yeah, Quick has both bidirectional and unidirectional streams. Um, stream so the question is, are the streams negotiated or is it just the client writing data on one side and so on? The streams are not negotiated, but the maximum allowable streams is something that I, both endpoints will advertise. 
and then there's a flow control for streams. Basically, there's a way to say, okay, I'm going to allow more streams now. So both endpoints can keep bumping that limit uh, higher and higher. And, and uh, uh, within under that limit, an application is free to open as many streams as it wants. Yeah. So the question is, what about congestion control? Is that stream-based or connection-based? Congestion control is connection-based on the entire loss recovery, congestion control, basically connection level constructs, and we use them for connection level things, not for stream level things. Yeah. So flow control, however, operates at the, at the stream level, and there also is a connection-wide flow control. So there's, there's connection-wide and there's per stream flow control. So, um, yeah. Um, so, so this is basically uh, uh, roughly the API that quickly uh, offers. This is exactly the API, sorry, that quickly offers, but I'm going to go over it very briefly. Um, this is, uh, uh, I have links, and you can, you can go look at the code. I, I, I give, there are examples as well. Um, but you can use quickly open stream to open a stream. Uh, these, this is all the stream level API right now that I'm going to show, and then I'll show the connection level API. Um, and then there's a callback that's registered to call when a stream gets opened on the other side. So uh, similarly, there's a stream level callback which says, okay, I have now space to send fill data in here. This is the bufferless API I was talking about. There's a callback that the application registers that, that quickly will call into when there's, there's availability of space to send new data. And similarly, there's other things about how when, when uh, something gets acknowledged, Again, remember that the application is the one that's maintaining all the buffers, right? Quickly doesn't have any buffers. So there's a callback to say, get rid of this data. It's been acknowledged from the peer. You don't need to maintain it anymore. Um, there's, there's uh, uh, yeah. So, so applications can call back into quickly and say, oh, you asked for data earlier. I didn't have any data, but now there's more data. And so there's all of those calls for basically, and all of these operate at the stream level because the expectation is that ultimately a consumer and a provider of data is operating at the stream level. That can be m one application, but the, the expectation is that you register one callback per stream. Um, on the receive side, there's a callback to, to receive data. When data arrives on a stream, you have the callback that, that, that uh, delivers that data. Um, and there's also a, a call from the application to say, I've removed this data from the receive buffer. Basically, you can move your, you know, your, your flow control window forward, for example. So that's, that's a sync down from the application, saying I've finished consuming this data. Um, closing streams, straightforward. There's a, there's a call to close a stream from the application, and there's a call back that says, yes, I've cleared out all the application, all the stream-related state. Um, and now we move on to the connection level stuff. So this is basically where uh, 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 there's, there's quickly is operating now, not at the stream level, but at the packet level. Right? So there's quickly send, which is basically, we are, we are, we are in the process right now of, of trying to figure out if we should rename some of these functions. So quickly send basically is called to say, you know, crank the wheel. See if there's any data to send, send it out if there's any data to send, or if there are retransmissions to send, or if a timer has fired, or so on and so forth. So this is basically what the event loop calls into. So the application is supposed to keep cranking the wheel by calling quickly send. How often should it call quickly send? Whenever it has data, and it has, like, you know, put, dump that into the stream buffer, and it can call quickly send to say, yep, I've, I've, I've put some data on the stream buffer, go ahead and, and not stream buffer, sorry, I've, I have some data to send and, and I'm gonna ask you to send it, or quickly returns a timeout. So the application is expected to call quickly get first timeout to say, when should I call back quickly send again? And quickly will say, here's a timeout. And that timeout is based on retransmission logic on, on uh, um, delayed acknowledgement logic, various logic, and quickly maintain state for what to do when the timer actually fires. But the timer itself is in the application's hand. The application is the one that's actually driving the event loop forward. So that's, that's what those two functions are for. Um, on receiving packets, quickly offers a decode packet. So you basically grab a packet and you, you uh, uh, decode it using quickly decode packet. And there's, uh, yeah, quickly 
uh, uh, receive, which which takes a decoded packet and then actually delivers it up. Yeah. the CDN that controls that because it knows uh, where the, um, the link characteristics of the end users. Sure. So are you going to deal with that problem in the server side or in the client side? In the receive, okay, in the, in the uh, you, you see, I mean, in the receiver side. I do understand. So, so I should probably make one thing clear because I've heard this now twice. Um, the goal here for the receive and the send side and the server and the client side, so to speak, is not to make quickly available on both sides, right? So quickly is basically just one end of the implementation. Just like TCP has both server and client implementations within the same implementation, we have everything in here. And, and uh, send and receive are both functions that are available at both endpoints. Uh, the client side is unlikely to be uh, uh, our server implementation commonly. We expect browsers to be doing the client-side implementation. So in terms of the optimization that you're talking about, that's going to happen at a layer that's above this API. I think that's a protocol level question that you're asking uh, at the media level. Uh, but we can talk about this more later as well. Um, but, but yeah, just to be clear, everything I'm showing here is basically a, a, quick, a full solid quickly implementation. At the same time, what we are working on is interoperating with other implementations so that our server can work with other clients and other servers can work with our test client, basically. Um, I am not going to go do, do the read through because I have 35 minutes and I, I think the subsequent things are going to be more interesting. I have a, l oh, wait a second. How did this jump? Um, go find that code. And and uh, uh, and try it out. Uh, I can I can run it and show you, but it's as you could run it yourself. Um, actually, you know what? I'll show you how this works. Cause it's a quick server using it's it's a it's a uh, where did it go? <coughs> oh, that's what we do. So I'll just I'll. Um, so that's basically just the, the echo server. I'm going to run the echo server there. If you can see, can you see, can everybody see that? It's kind of tiny. Okay, let me see. You don't have to sit and memorize this right now. It's quite fine. The point here is that running the echo server requires you to supply a server key and a server certificate. Because again, as I said, it's always encrypted and it needs these things to, to set up the TLS server and the, the cert manager to, to actually do the right things here. So now the server's running on that side. I am going to run the client on this side and connect to the server and I'll say, and there we go. There you go, yay, the first bits of Quick have flown. Um, so that's that's the echo server. You can you can you can play around. It's, it's a very simple implementation that uh, Kazoo put together, uh, especially for this. So go take a look, um, and it's 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 a good way to get started if you're trying to write a simple client and server using Quick. So so I'm going to move past this, and I'm going to go to tooling because I know there are thoughts about tooling. Yes, question. So what the question is, what is, what is the first packet of the client? How does it get encrypted? What's the keying material? So the first packet of the client is from the client in a fresh connection that you've never spoken to the server before is encrypted. It's effectively obfuscated. It's encrypted with a static key that's not static, with the, with the key that we are publishing in the draft. So, so but it also include, uh, 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 so that's that's not going to be something that you call we would call real encryption. Um, on a subsequent connection, however, and this is the more important one. On subsequent connection, where we expect to get zero round trip time, we encrypted using the, using the zero RTT keys that we got the last time around. 
So the f yeah. So, um, so tooling. This is, this has been a burning question for a lot of people about Quick uh, because well the first thing I'll say is well there's a Wireshark dissector so go bonkers. There is tooling available. Isn't Wireshark enough for everybody? It's not apparently. Why isn't it enough in this case? He says it's encrypted and is very baffled. How is that a Wireshark dissector? So there is a Wireshark dissector and you're right, it's encrypted. So you need to feed it a master key for it to be able to open up the packets and look at it. Because without that, it can basically read, it can still read a few bytes, but there, aren't, there isn't very much that you can really look at in a packet trace that makes it interesting. So, um, so yes, so there's a bit of a problem here, right? If you want to grab traces, you have to grab the key as well. What what does it mean though? If you have an encrypted payload, in encrypted headers and everything else, what does it mean if you're trying to record traffic? If you're going to use Wireshark, what does it mean? You're going to have to record the entire payload for the connection. You can't simply record the headers. You have to record the entire payload, you have to record the whole connection, and then you have to go decrypt it. And, and that's got all sorts of issues, especially if you're logging this, if you're storing this somewhere, it's got all sorts of PII type issues and privacy issues. Um, so there's a lot of issues with this. So one of the things that we've, we've, we've realized is that this is not adequate and we need something that's, that's, that's better. And so we've been trying and we've been working on, uh, not when I say we, the broader community, not just, not just me, we've been working on endpoint based packet tracing. The point being here that the server and the clients are best positioned to actually describe what's going on in the connection and they have the keys and they're going to be looking at the packets anyway. So uh, as long as you're not, as long as you're an endpoint, we ought to be able to at least grab traces at the endpoints themselves. So uh, this has been gaining a lot of traction and this is what we have been working on at Fastly as well. So I'll show you some of, some of the tooling that's being built in the community right now around this. So the idea here is that the quick server and the quick client log packet level events and various other events and those logs turn into, you know, various visualizations and other things. Um, so there are two uh, uh, um, tools. I will be showing you one of them in more detail than the other one, but there's QuickTrace and there's QuickVis and both of the implementers will be uh, present at the IETF uh, coming up and they'll be, so if you're interested, they'll be there and you can talk to them. The first one is QuickTrace, which comes out of uh, Google. And this was written by Viktor Vasiliev and others. And this is open source and it's available. Um, you basically, you feed it a protobuf or a JSON if you want. There's a converter that converts from JSON to protobuf and then feeds that into the tool. And this is an awesome tool because it basically gives you a packet trace um, that you can get. This looks very much like other TCP uh, traces that you might have seen. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show this in a moment. But this basically is generated ent entirely by the server process, the quick server generating logs that generate those packet traces. This is not from a PCAP. The second tool is uh, QuickWiz, which is written by Robin Marks and, uh, and others at the uh, University of Hasselt. And they've done some extraordinary work. Um, they take uh, input, uh, the input they take in as JSON and they produce basically various state transitions in the transport and HTTP levels and what's going on on different streams at different times and a full timing diagram. This is produced from traces. Um, of course, they, they, can, they can do partial traces, meaning only one end, one side, or they can take uh, traces on the client and the server and put, pull this together. So this is some incredible work that they've been doing. And also, you know, various other uh, graphs that you might be familiar with uh, in the TCP world. Do you know how performant are those, are those tools? Because I remember a couple of years ago, we did the algorithm on that, and I remember how they did for very short traces. Um, I can't speak to that right now. I've not really tested them with large traces. The quick trace is actually super, super good for large traces. Uh, quick whiz, I don't know. I haven't really worked with it uh, myself. I'm, I'm planning to talk to them. But there's active development. Again, pretty much everything you're going to find in this world right now is rough edged because all of this is work in progress, right? I mean, we are just about stabilizing the protocol format. 
at the moment. So you're going to find that the things have rough edges, but these are things that we can make work uh, uh, with, with continued involvement and development. So, um, so before going into this, I want to talk about exactly what the quick packet looks like. So you know what you're looking for, so you know what it is that we are tracing, right? So, and this is also a little bit of protocol detail that is hopefully helpful for you to understand how quick packets look, how quick enca encapsulation look, how the packetization works. So quick packets have come in two, f two varieties because one is boring, we like, we got two. Um, there's a the long header format and there's the short header format. The long header is primarily used during the handshake, not just primarily, it's only used during the handshake. This is to establish various kinds of things that we don't know about the peer. But we, so this is what the long header looks like. I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but it's got, as you can see, it has a version number in there and it has connection IDs, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, in there as well. Um, and once we've negotiated the version and once we finish the handshake, we don't need a number of these things. So we can go with a shorter version of the header and that basically includes uh, uh, only a handful of things. It has a packet number and it has uh, uh, a destination connection ID. It doesn't have a version, notably, as you can see. Now, not all of these uh, um, are visible on the wire, to be clear, and not all of these are going to be fixed in time. Our expectation is that as quick versions uh, uh, happen, that many of these things will change. Uh, specifically, there's a draft called the quick invariance draft that talks about which parts of the header, encrypted or not, will remain the same across quick versions and which parts are not guaranteed to remain the same. This is basically a way for us to tell middle box vendors or, or any vendor basically what they can go and ossify and what they cannot ossify. So if you look at this header, it basically shows you that you know from the long, from the long header, those flags are basically off limits those can keep changing across uh, versions, but the first bit of one is going to remain the same across all versions of Quick. For the short header, there's the connection ID is visible, and that's basically it, and the zero. So commonly, through the lifetime of a connection, there's gonna be the zero that's at the beginning, that's gonna be visible, and then there's the connection ID that's gonna be visible. That's all that's gonna be visible. Now bear in mind that the connection ID itself can be renegotiated under crypto cover, so the connection ID can change within a connection. So if you're gonna go latch on to a connection ID and think this is a connection, <laughs> eh, not gonna work. Sorry? Oh, the long header, so the long header has connection ID. So the question is, uh, if I understand correctly, you're saying the long header doesn't, uh, there's no connection ID in the long header? No, so usually there is a long header that's create a new connection, right? Yep. And then you have a connection ID. Yep. Is, can it be that in this connection, both of the ends, I mean, for example, for MTP, that's you know, a building a related connection, that's will be created uh, without any Oh, I see. So you're asking if you can create a connection without actually using a long header. No, that's not the case right now. I you can't, no. No, not doable either. I mean, not, not, not with the way that the handshake mechanisms work. It's technically possible to do it in a different protocol, but that's not our goal, yeah. So uh, that's what the packet headers look like. What are inside of packets? Beyond the packet header, there are quick frames. That's basically what they are. I'll talk about them in a, in, in a moment. Every frame looks like this. There's a frame type, and there are type-dependent fields. Okay, so there's a basically quick packet has a packet header and has a bunch of frames, and each of them has a type, and then various type-dependent fields. And these are all the different types of frames that are currently defined in the draft. As you can see, the ones that the, the functions, at least that you might be familiar with, I'll, I'll point to them. There's the stream frame and there's the act frame. Stream frame carries data, the act frame carries acknowledgements. 
right? So those are basically not part of the packet header. They're all contained inside of a packet as frames. You can see various other things such as max data, all the max data, max stream data, max streams, pretty much all of these are basically flow control related uh, uh, frames. And all the control signaling that happens within, within the endpoints happens with frames. So some of these frames, like the ping frame, is basically a one byte frame. All it is is a frame type, there's no data in it. But they're all, all of these frames are used for control uh, signaling between the two endpoints. Um, right. So let's look at one of these in, in a little bit of detail. So we try to understand basically how it is that data flows in a quick connection. So a stream frame, which carries application data ultimately, has these headers. It has a stream ID, which indicates the, the stream number, basically, that this data is going to. It has an offset that's optional, the offset in the stream. It's a byte offset within the stream. So one stream is roughly, is semantically, equivalent to a TCP connection. Once every stream is a byte stream, right? So you can have multiple of these within a connection. And the length uh, uh, tells you how big this particular frame itself is. And then there's stream data. There's actually the data, right? So that's what a stream frame contains. So let's look at how a quick packet would look with various things in it. So here's a quick short header packet. It's the header bit is one that indicates it's a short header packet. There's the spin bit, which I will not go into, but that is basically uh, a, a bit that is supposed to indicate that is supposed to be used by operators for doing passive measurements of RTT specifically. Um, there's a destination connection ID, there's a key phase, and there's a packet number, and those are uh, encrypted. So the grayed out ones are basically encrypted. Even the packet number, by the way, is encrypted. So a middle box can't even see what the packet number of a particular packet is. Um, and a quick packet, as I mentioned, has frames. So in this particular example, there's a stream, there are two stream frames and an act frame. All right? So let's look at one example. One example. Right? So this is packet number 56, and it is carrying data from stream ID 5 at, at, at offset 1123, and it has a length of 500 bytes. And it says that this is not the last frame in this particular stream, which means that uh, it's the, the fin bit is set to false. And then it carries application data. Everything good so far? There's going to be a quiz, so pay attention. If you're falling asleep, good time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. All right, um, that's in that stream ID, that's in that stream frame. Um, this is another stream frame. This carries data from another stream ID, right? Stream ID eight, it has a length of 300, the fin is false, but the offset's not there. What does that mean? The offset's not there. Zero, thank you. Yes, the obvious conclusion, yes. So offset is optional. If it's, if it's not there, it's zero. There's a bit that indicates if the offset is present or not in the flags. Um, and then there's application data, of course. So this is fine. And in this example, continued example, we've removed the length. What does that mean? That means no data. No, it doesn't mean there's no data. Although you can send an empty stream frame. The maximum length. The maximum length that goes up to the end of the packet, which means this particular packetization is incorrect. What it really looks like, should look like, is this. Basically, it says everything from here up until the end of the packet is this stream data. All right, so the length is optional as well if you're going to. So the, in the common case, when you're packing every packet with just data from one stream in the bulk transfer case, you, you have the offset, but you remove the length. That's the general idea. So um, that's what we got for these. these uh, this is what a stream frame looks like, all right? Um, and going back to the, the, the ACK frame now, let's look at the ACK frame. Okay, the ACK frame has a number of fields in it, and it has, if you're familiar, I'll try to draw parallels. So how many of you are familiar with the TCP packet format? Seriously, like four people in this room? How many of you are sleeping right now? <laughs> Good. Yeah, I was expecting that response. All right. Um, 
wake up, wake up, wake up. Like I said, there's a quiz. Um, and, and you won't be allowed to go out and get coffee after this if you don't answer the questions on the quiz. <laughs> Critical. I mean, not just reward, right? But, but what is that? The, the carrot and the stick. How many people get this off What's it? How many people get this off I have a man there. He's going to hold the gate there. Um, so the ACK itself carries a largest acknowledged. What does the equivalent, not the equivalent, what does the TCP packet carry in it? It carries, the, the, it carries a sequence number on the send side, on the receive side, or meaning on the, on the ACK side, it's got a cumulative ACK. Okay, cumulative ACK is the smallest number that you received in order. This one is the largest acknowledged. It's the other end, okay? So in TCP, you might have SAC blocks, cumulative ACK, and then SAC blocks after that. In QUIC, it's the largest acknowledged. That's what's sent in the ACK. Now, the other things are also sent, and we look at that. ACK delay. If some of you were at the TCP analytics talk uh, session this morning, you might have heard this thing about, you know, we don't know if the RTD carries in it delayed ACKs, uh, the, 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 the amount of time that this is, the receiver was sitting on an ACK or not, right? Delayed ACK delays are captured as part of the round trip time, sadly, in TCP. But here, the receiver explicitly encodes the ACK delay, meaning how long did it sit on an ACK before send, on a packet before sending the ACK back. So if I receive a packet and I'm waiting to send an ACK because I'm gonna delay my acknowledgement for a little while, then when I send the ACK back, I'm going to encode that time inside the ACK and ship it back so that the sender has a better estimate of the round trip time and can get rid of the, the receiver's ACK delay. Um, it has an ACK range count, and this is these are the ACK ranges that are appearing. Um, there's the, f there's the, the first ACK range, which is basically contiguous from the largest ACK. We'll look at an example, and we'll talk about this in a moment. So the ACK, and then there are subsequent ACK ranges. ECN counts, I'm not even going to go into. So let's look at an example, okay? That's probably best done with an example here. And this is one example. So let's say that the packets received are one through 125, okay? The time, and let's say that the time since the largest received at the receiver is 25 milliseconds when the receiver generates an acknowledgement. Now this is represented in a particular way. It's a shifted value to, to allow for larger uh, range of values. And the shift is negotiated, but it's defaulted at three. This is very much like your window scaling, basically, right? So the value that's encoded in the, in the uh, ACK is in microseconds. And in this case, it would be 3125. Because it's 25 milliseconds shifted by three, the receiver will encode 3125 microseconds inside the ACK, and, the, the, and that's what's going to be sent. Does it make sense? Yes, no? The receiver is, okay, I'll go over this again. I'll keep going over this until it makes it. The point is that the receiver is waiting for 25 milliseconds before it sends an acknowledgement and it encodes it in a particular way. You don't need to know what the encoding is because you're not going to write that encoder tomorrow. It's fine. All you need to know is that 3125 is 25 milliseconds. What triggers sending the act? What triggers sending the act? The same as with TCP. It's a delayed act time. There's a delayed act timer. You can piggyback it with data that's coming out uh, or a second packet that's received. I see. So there is. Uh, so for TCP, when we receive like two segments, we immediately act that one, right? If it's larger yes. than MSS. Yes. Do you have the same thing in Quick, or um, do you always so wait for it? So it is. It is right now recommended that. I can't actually remember what the language in the draft is, but that is one area where we have flexibility. We, 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 uh, um, you can have, you can wait for a larger number of packets to be, uh, um, uh, to be received before sending an acknowledgement. And there's actually a draft that, uh, that some of us are going to write together about that. But uh, at the moment, because it's simply behaving like TCP, the current, current answer is two again, but that's negotiable. And uh, like in ECN with transmission, we also send immediate SACs. Right. And, and those are all planned for? Those are generally, yes. So the behavior right now is going to be generally, those triggers will be roughly the same as TCP, right. but there's possibility to extend it to, to non-TCP-like behaviors. So, yes. so, but if it, if it mostly models the TCP 
state machine, the highest act doesn't work, right? I mean, because that TCP assumes that you are cleaning up yep. la uh, like contiguous blocks. This yep. means you could leave holes behind. So yes, you can. So how do you clean that up, or do you not have? That's to an excellent that? question. Uh, do you mind holding on to that hey. question, asking me again in a bit, because I do want to. Uh, 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 I want to answer that question. So that the time since largest received is not the most important thing. If you didn't get it, it's fine. We can move on. The other stuff is independent. The act fields are basically largest received so far. In this case, it's 125, because we've received everything from 1 to 125 so far. So the first act range is the largest act is 125, and then how many packets below it contiguously are acknowledged. And in this case, that's 124 because 1 through 125 have been received. So I'm going to say largest act is 125, and then I'm also acting 124 packets below it. That's what that says. The act range count of 0 means there are no uh, discontiguous blocks below that. That's what that says. Or at least I'm not reporting anything else below that. That's what that says. So this is what that looks like. The act frame looks like this. Yeah? Now to this, let's add a little twist. Yes, excellent point. Uh, he says, your acts are in packets, but the stream data is in offsets and stream IDs. What the bleep? Can I say that on camera? It's on CBS, right? What the fuck? Um, yeah, you're exactly right. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, that, that's actually one of the features, right? Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So let's, let's do a little twist here. A little twist. Now we receive 130. Why? Because the internet sucks and drops packets. And so we have 130. And now things change a little bit. Now the largest received is 130. It's bumped up to 130 because, yes, that's in fact the largest we've seen. The first act range, how many packets contiguously below 130 are you reporting as acknowledged? None. Right? Because 129 is not acknowledged, immediately the first act range becomes of size 0. Okay? And now I'm reporting a gap. I'm reporting a gap from 126 to 129. I'm saying there's a gap that goes from 129 down to 126. And then I'm acknowledging everything below that. 125 to 1, again I'm acknowledging. Okay? So the way these are encoded, and again, you don't need to understand this, you can think about this later, is this gap is simply en encoded as 129 minus 126, which is 3, and the ACK range is again 125 minus 1, which is 124. Okay? That's how this encoding works. Um, so that's what that looks like, the ACK frame for that. Final twist. Promise, this is the final twist. Let's add 129 to this. Okay? So now we receive 129. Why? Again, because the internet sucks. And now, the largest packet received is still 130, but the first act range has grown by 1, because now I'm acknowledging one packet contiguously below 130. So again, notice that the goal is that in the common case, you're going to receive packets in order. That means you'll have the largest act and the uh, first act range as basically conveying all your information. But in this case, again, your gap has reduced in size and the act range has reduced. But this is, I hope this is clear, more or less, and if it's not, it's okay. You can catch up with this. Um, you don't have to understand the details here now. So that's what that looks like. That act frame is what that looks like. So um, this is absolutely the last example, I promise. The last twist. Let's say packet 56 was dropped, right? This is packet 56, right? Let's say this packet that is being sent right here. See, the, how do I know this is packet 56? Because this PN packet number here says 56. And let's say this packet that carries that stream frame, that stream frame, and that act frame is actually dropped by the network. Okay? And eventually, because Quake is reliable, Quake has loss detection machinery, it detects this packet as lost. Right? And let's also assume that stream 8 was reset. Remember stream 8? That's the middle stream frame there. When, when I say reset, this is something that an application can do in Quick. An application can say, I don't care, care about the stream anymore. Let's not send data on the stream anymore. Cancel the stream. I'm done with the stream. 
Okay, remember stream is just an abstraction within a connection. That doesn't mean the connection is closed, the stream is closed. Okay, so at this point, quick detects, after all of this has happened, quick detects packet 56 is lost. And let's say that the last packet that I had sent was packet 74. What should happen next? Quick needs to retransmit data that was in, in 56, right? So this is packet 56, this needs to be retransmitted. So first question, what, should the, what will the packet number be? 56, seems obvious. How many people say 56? Oh, come on, raise your hands, you won't. How many people say 75? It's 75. It's not 56 because I'm actually not retransmitting 56. I don't care to retransmit 56. One more second. What should I retransmit in here? What frames should I send again? Should I send stream ID 5? Yes. Why not? Somebody said no. Why would the offset be different? That packet was lost. Those offsets were dropped. Those bytes were dropped. This offset is only within the stream. So stream ID 5 is still in that, that piece of data that would have been delivered in stream ID 5 did not, receive, did not reach the receiver. So we need to retransmit those bytes. The offset within the stream remains the same because that's delivery order within the stream. That hasn't changed. What about stream ID 8? We just, huh? It's closed. Do we need to retransmit that? Why? Somebody says yes. Yeah. Why would you need it? You're right. He says that at the time that packet 56 was constructed, stream 8 was alive. But we no longer need to deliver it to the receiver because the receiver has also closed the stream. It's gone. The stream has been reset. The receiver does not care about receiving data on a reset stream. That's the, that's the semantic. I mean, that's a quick semantic, and that's something you didn't, you, but that's what I want to point out here. The separation between streams and connection is very, very strong and quick. Yes. Question. Trying to be more disciplined. Um, so, but that implies that the other side is effectively left dangling, right? There is no, the receiver is now going to do a timeout disconnect because that particular stream has no signal that said, go cancel yourself. That is a, st that is a kind of signal, and that's called a reset stream control signal. So, but that's going to be in a frame. That might have been in 74 as a reset. That, that could be in, yes, that might okay. have been in 74, okay. exactly. Okay. And if that's dropped, that is retransmitted. As well. Oh, oh so the cancel is actually guaranteed. Yes. Okay. okay. Because otherwise exactly, yeah. yes. Okay. So the reset of a stream means don't care about the stream anymore. Fin of a stream, very much like TCP reset and TCP fin, means, yes, I'm still going to send you data, even though I've sent you a fin, because they all need to get delivered in order. So, in this case, we don't care about these, t oh, I should have asked you this question. Should the ACK frame be read? I'll ask you. Forget you saw that. <laughs> <laughs> right answer, thank you. For playing along, you get points for playing along. Should the ACK frame be retransmitted? Yes. <laughs> See, now I'm gonna hold you to it, why? <laughs> he said yes, and then when I pinned him down, he said no, for the record, because you're not on the mic at the time. So the ACK frame doesn't need to be retransmitted because it's carrying stale information. Acknowledgements in Quick, very much like in TCP, are cumulative in the sense that a later acknowledgement carries the information of a previous acknowledgement. All right? So we don't need to send that. We could send a new acknowledgement. We could, in, in place of these two things, we could send other stuff. We can send new stream data, we can send other control messages, we can send whatever we want. But it does not have to send these two bits of information and it won't send these two bits of information. Yes, question.
So the question is, does the quick library maintain information about packet sizes, offsets, and various things, packetization information, basically, so that when an acknowledgment comes, it does the right thing by pulling information from the right streams and so on. If it doesn't come, then it marks those as lost. Yes, in both cases it does. It has to maintain all of that information. And when a packet is acknowledged, it goes up and tells the stream, hey, this data has been delivered. And if a packet is lost, it says, I lost this stream data. And, and I can retransmit if you would like. So, yes, you fetch data from the application again. Yeah, so the question is, can you, we remove stuff we don't want to send in the packet, but can we add new stuff? The short answer is yes. That's sort of the whole point. Packets are basically containers. In Quick, packets are simply containers. They carry a packet number that is monotonically increasing. No matter what you put in them, the packet number is used for sending, and it maintains only thing packet number encodes is transmission order. So an earlier question was about, Oh, this has, there's, there's packet numbers in this, and there's stream IDs and offsets in that. The acknowledgments are for the containers. The acknowledgments say, I have received this packet. What's in the packet? Well, you ought to know. You are the one who sent me the packet. That's basically what it means. So I maintain state about what I'm putting inside a packet. I give it a packet number. I ship it. An acknowledgment is received which says, I've received this packet. That's enough. And if I lose the packet, if the packet is detected as lost, again, I know what was in the packet, so I can decide what to retransmit, what not to retransmit, and so on at the time of retransmission. The value of separating these two things, again, is that loss detection is separate from loss recovery. I can detect a loss, and I can, in fact, choose not to retransmit any of the things that were in that packet. That's perfectly fine. In the example I just showed you, if stream five had also been canceled, when I detect a loss of packet 56, I do not have to send a packet 74 or 75 because there's nothing in that packet that I need to retransmit anymore. So loss detection is separate from actually retransmitting the bits that were lost, okay? So that's hugely useful also because your, your uh, stream offsets indicate what uh, uh, basically, so, so the, 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 the key distinction here is packet numbers are used for transmission order, stream IDs and offsets are used for delivery order. Okay, so this is the separation that we are able to achieve and TCP doesn't have the separation but we're able to achieve in quick um, with that. So packets uh, end up being containers. Yep. Yes. So the question is, it's not like UDP. But the question is, is this, uh, uh, is this like where you, can, where you can drop certain frames for video encoding, video streaming, for example, where you can say, I don't care about these streams anymore. That's exactly what it is. And there's actually work on trying to make this work for video. Um, yes. Can you allow loss in a certain stream, within a stream? At the moment, that abstraction is not available in Quick. So the way you would, if you wanted to, um, if you wanted to, in, depending on the, it would depend, so, so in short, no, not at the moment. But that's an extension that people are talking about, have been talking about, and the working group has been trying to keep it tight to, to not expand scope to increase, include everything. But that's coming very, very soon. Uh, if there are a lot of gaps, yes, it will get bigger and bigger, much like SAC ranges. Um, so yes, that is. So, so somebody else asked, Sriji asked this question earlier, and I'll answer it now about when do you stop reporting something? Because in this world, you're never going to fill a gap, right? So at some point, you have to decide to stop reporting. And that is actually left to the implementation to some extent. We've left it to the implementation in the spec, but there are some recommendations about what's a good time. Specifically, because every quick packet carries a packet number, funnily, acts get acknowledged. Remember that acts are frames that are carried in packets, and those packets also get acknowledged? 
I'll let you think about that because it could loot, it, could, it can lead to an infinite loop. It can lead to act ping pong, uh, but there are there are safeguards in place to not let that happen. But what it means is that I can know when a peer has seen my acknowledgement. So when I know that that guy has seen this information, I can stop reporting it. So I can I only need to report as long as I know that the other end has not seen this information. As long as the peer has seen this information, meaning that I receive an ACK for the packet that carried my ACK frame, I can retire, so to speak, that ACK information. I do not have to report that again. So that's, again, a, 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 a trick that you can use. Or uh, you would also use some sort of a timing, saying you report this for one or two round trip times, and then after that you don't report it anymore. Um, and another huge value is that retransmissions are not automatically high priority. Basically, stream priorities allow you to to determine whether you want to send a retransmission now or not. So quick separates what is sent from when it is sent. Um, I am uh, basically out of time at this point. It's 2.32, and I don't want to run into your break into the next session. But I will show you one very quick thing, and then, ha ha, one very quick thing. Um, so here's a, I will show you a quick server, I'm running a quick server here, and I'm running a UDP forwarder that basically will introduce uh, a drop at some point in the connection. Um, and it introduces loss and delay and things like that. So a simulator which also will forward packets along. This is all available in the Quickly repository, by the way. Um, and no. Why would you do that? Maybe I'm running it somewhere else. Apologies. Yes. <laughs> it's fine. And here's the client. And the client basically talked and sent a bunch of stuff. And now I have traces. And this is what uh, this is what I was. It's the JSON stuff that spit out of the server as the connection proceeds. And uh, have a converter that basically adapts this to things and then converts it into a protobuf and and um, I can plot it, and there you go. There's a nice little packet trace. If you're not familiar with the packet trace, it's time on the x-axis and packets data on the y-axis. And what you're seeing here is in blue is packets sent, and the green is acknowledgments received for those packets. And you can see that every packet, there's basically various things, including the frame list. And the frame list in this case has stream ID 0, and you can see it has certain offsets in it. Uh, and the acknowledgments are basically for packets. And along with the acknowledgments, I can also sh show various transport state because the server, as it receives an acknowledgment, is logging this stuff as well in the JSON. I just want to show you one quick thing, which is here. OK. So the reds here are packets that are lost. OK? So this says lost packet 9, which means a server said, at this moment in time, I'm logging packet 9 as lost. OK? But let's go back and see what was in packet 9. Packet 9 carried the stream 0 data, offset 3713. Yes? And that was dropped in the network. And of course, we're going to retransmit that. But as you can see, the retransmission happens here, where it is sent as packet 38, but it carries the same stream ID and the same stream offsets. So if you're used to seeing TCP traces, this will look slightly weird, because again, as was pointed out earlier, gaps are not filled. Retransmissions don't show up along the same horizontal line. They're going to show up later. So you. So, so you're going to have to reorient yourself a little bit to looking at these traces because they are different. But at the same time, these traces can be substantially more, uh, substantially richer because we can actually record a lot of details about what's going on at the server in these traces. And with that, I will end. Sorry that it's only five minutes left for your break. Uh, but thank you for being patient and not sleeping through this presentation post-lunch. Thank you again. And I'll be around.